Hey everyone, today I'm going to show you how to run your home lab with infrastructure as code like a boss. We're combining together Terraform, Packer, Ansible with Semaphore UI that I showcased recently and GitLab CICD to automate everything in just minutes. So stick around, let's dive in. Now, why does infrastructure as code really matter, especially in the home lab? Well, many reasons. Let's talk about those in more detail. First of all, you get more consistency. No more oops moments from clicking around in GUIs and clicking the wrong thing or hitting the wrong key. Code guarantees every build matches your last. Second, you get version control. You can store everything in Git, branch experiments, roll back mistakes, and collaborate safely. Number three is the pets versus cattle scenario. For years in legacy traditional infrastructure organizations, servers were treated as pets. In other words, you did not want to mishandle a single server. You handled those with kid gloves and you made sure that updates were applied. All of those things were done just so. However, with infrastructure as code, you can treat servers as disposable cattle, break things, rebuild things in minutes, and learn faster and get away from babying your servers as those pets. Also, you get built-in documentation with the infrastructure's code. In fact, your code and commit history become your lab notebook and your audit trail for all of those changes that have been made. I treat my home lab just like production. Infrastructure is repeatable and it's way more fun. So let's dive into the first tool that I use in my home lab and production. Terraform is the de facto standard for infrastructure's code. Let's take a look at a snippet that spins up a Debian LXC container on Proxmox, and I'll show you just how easy this is. Okay, so I wanna show you guys the beauty of using Terraform in your home lab for infrastructure as code and provisioning infrastructure programmatically in a way that's repeatable, it's easy, and it's just cool. So the first thing that we want to do with our Proxmox environment is navigate to data center. We're going to go to permissions, API tokens. And as you can see here, I've got an API token that has been created and it's assigned to this user. So I just simply added the Terraform user and then I went to API tokens and I'll just step through like I'm doing this fresh and you just select your user. I select Terraform and you can call this anything on the token ID. So we can just say Terraform one and you want to uncheck the privilege separation. So you just uncheck privilege separation and click add. So I'm not going to do that since I already have the Terraform user. However, I can just double click in and show you what that looks like. Uncheck. Once I would have hit add, you would see the API token generated. So that is what you need to do to begin with. Now, what I've done as well is I have a tfvars file. And in that file, what we have are the variables that we want to use for the connection that we're making with our Terraform provisioner. So here is literally the address to my Proxmox server. So I've got my IP address, port 8006, API2 slash JSON. And then this should look familiar as we have the Terraform at PAM. And then the only difference is we put the exclamation point and then Terraform and combining that with that Proxmox token. Now here is literally the Proxmox token that I was given. The node name is the name of our Proxmox server. So that's where that comes from. And then LXC password is the password that we want to use for the LXC containers that we are provisioning. Then what we have to do is simply do our Terraform workflow. I have my code in this particular folder. So the first thing I want to do is a Terraform init. Now I had already ran this before the video, so it didn't have to pull anything down, but you can see the output is basically the same Terraform init. 
It's making sure we've got the Telmate Proxmox Provisioner installed, version 2.9.14 at the time of this video. And now what we need to do is just run a Terraform plan. Now a plan validates your Terraform code. It basically shows you a what if, if you're familiar with that flag like in PowerShell or another scripting language, it shows you what is going to happen. And I like that Terraform is very visual. You can see the green pluses. That means that we're adding these objects or these things into our Proxmox environment. So it looks like a lot. However, one thing I am doing that I'll show you that's really cool in the TF file, I've got a variable here that I could actually move over to TFRs just to make it cleaner. However, I've got it in the, the variables.tf file and it's LXC count. And as you can see here, I've got number. Well, this allows me to quickly spin up any number of LXC containers. So if I want to change that from five to 10, I'm going to save this file and let's rerun. As you can see here, it says plan five to add zero to change zero to destroy. Well, let's run the Terraform plan again. And this matches what I just put in the variables file. So let's do this. Let's actually run a Terraform apply now. And of course, it looks just like the plan, except it says type in yes if you actually want to do this. So I'm going to type yes. And now we can see that it's creating. Let's flip back to the uh, Proxmox VE server. And as we can see real time, we are seeing those LXC containers spin up inside our Proxmox VE environment. Super cool. So I'm not sitting here having to right click on my PVE node, say create container, create a host name. As error prone as that is, see how quickly we were able to spin up these new LXC containers programmatically. And here is what's also cool is once you're done with it, let's say you're spinning this up for a lab. Once you're done with it, we can simply type Terraform destroy and we can see it's got 10 to destroy and we can type yes once again. And we're going to see these fade away right before our eyes as the destroy looks at our Terraform state and says, OK, I have these objects that were created. I'm going to now destroy those objects and we're back to a clean slate. This is super awesome for a home lab, I think, and definitely something that you should check out. Next up is HashiCorp Packer. Instead of manually building templates in your virtualized environment, having to install updates manually, install tools, and all of those other things that we have to do in an artisanal way by hand, Packer allows you to do that in an automated way. You can keep evergreen templates in your virtualized environment so that you can always spin up a fresh copy of your Windows Server operating system or Ubuntu server with all of the patches installed, all of the tools installed, and anything else that you want to include in those images. HashiCorp Packer is a tool that gives you those immutable versioned templates. And once you have that automated template that Packer builds for you, you can clone those off with Terraform, as we mentioned in the previous step, and new VMs boot in just seconds with all of your tweaks baked in, all the updates installed, and again, you do all of this in code. So let's see what Packer code looks like in Proxmox that builds a Windows Server 2025 template. Here is my uh, Windows Server 2025 Packer.hcl file. So as you can see, we've got our uh, required plugins. We've got Proxmox here and where we're pulling it from. We've got uh, the source is Proxmox ISO. And notice we've got Windows 2025, and this should look familiar to us after we discussed how we uh, connect with our Terraform code with that provisioner using that API token. So here are a couple of those variables that we're passing in there. Also under uh, the EFI config, so we are properly setting this up with that uh, EFI partition. And here is our ISO file. And that is something that you upload to your Proxmox data store. So it's going to pull that. We can see from our local storage on Proxmox, we're defining it as an ISO. And here we have the ISO image that I'm using. The additional ISO files, we've got the vert IO drivers, and this is an old image that I need to replace. 
You can also enter your checksum here if you want that to be checked for validity. And here we're defining the VM name Win 2025 template, uh, Windows Server 2025 template on the description, setting the memory, the cores. Let's see what else interesting we have here. We've got the network adapters. We have it attaching to the uh, default Linux bridge, the vert IO uh, configuration there. And then also storage pool, we are taking the storage from our local LVM, setting up a 40 gig disk for this template. And of course the communicator is WinRM. We've got administrator as the username. This var admin password is contained in the sensitive dash variables packer file. And here we've got let me in one dollar so you can see where this variable comes into play admin underscore password and then of course here is our proxmox api token uh, our proxmox host and then again here is the user for that uh, proxmox api token so that's pretty much it three files and we just simply do a packer build and it will look at these files and so as long as we have the resources that we have to find in the HCL file, such as the ISO, uh, the vert IO drivers, this will build a Windows Server 2025 template in Proxmox that you can then use to quickly spin up Windows Server 2025 servers. Now, once your golden image is ready, you can use another tool, Ansible, for day two config. Ansible allows you to install packages, set up users, tune sysctl, and much more. I use Semaphore UI to run playbooks from GitLab. Now, while you can install software with Terraform with provisioners, Ansible is much better suited for this task. Let me show you what Ansible code that I am using and running in Semaphore UI to do various things in the home lab. So this is one of my Semaphore instances that I'm using for demos and what have you. I just wanted to show you guys under the task templates what I have. If you have these like little nagging tasks that you find yourself having to scramble, looking at your notes, trying to figure out exactly what you did. I like these little playbooks that allow you to do things like add Visudo. So if you're adding a user to the sudoers file and using Visudo, then this playbook allows you to do that. So um, I have a playbook that allows me to just quickly uh, change out the user that I want to use and add that user to the sudo users group. Also installing Docker, that is something if you've got a Linux host that you have just spun up or maybe one that you already had provision that you want to simply add Docker to and you have the need to do that. And I like to keep this playbook handy. Also, I use NetData in the lab. I think NetData is a great solution. They have a fantastic home lab license that I think is a really great value at $90 a year. And you're not limited. You could spin up thousands of nodes according to what I understand with their license agreement on that $90 and you're good to go. So this playbook for me installs the NetData agent connected to my NetData room as they refer to it, as well as um, I believe the account ID or something of that sort. So I already have all of that uh, pre-populated and I can just simply point this playbook at a specific Linux server. Of course, NTP server configuration and then updates. Finally, treat your home lab repos like enterprise code. I'm using GitLab CICD in my home lab and I want to show you my GitLab pipeline file that validates my code. It produces reviewable artifacts. It builds images. It scans those images and it even deploys the configuration end to end automated with a single merge. So if I update the Git repo, all of those steps are performed automatically. Let's see how you can do that. So the final piece for me in the infrastructure is code workflow in my home lab is GitLab and GitLab CI/CD. And a recent project that I'm really proud of how it turned out is my ARPWatch project that I'm building a custom ARPWatch container for the home lab. And I take it through these various stages of the build, including building the container image, linting the code, testing the code, scanning for vulnerabilities and other security issues using Trivi, we push that container image to our container registry, which is also housed in GitLab, my local instance. 
And then we're also deploying that. So with a single commit, with this pipeline file that I have set up, so if I'm on my dev branch of code, if I go through and I'm working on an enhancement, it will take this container image build all the way through these various stages so that if we are pushing to dev or prod for that matter, um, if we push that to dev, it gets tagged appropriately and then it gets deployed to dev or deployed to prod. And what I actually have here is the credentials in an environment variable in my pipeline stored in GitLab CICD. It connects to my Docker host and it actually runs my uh, Docker Compose code. So it actually connects, reaches out, runs the Docker Compose. You can see here dash F and we're actually just passing in this Docker dash Compose dash dev uh, dash D and then we're Docker image prune. We're pruning off those old images that we no longer have use for. So each time this runs, we pull the latest image, we spin it up on the host, and then the host gets cleaned up from those old images. Well, what do you think? Running your home lab with infrastructure as code isn't just for IT pros. It's really a game changer for your learning and productivity in the lab. Pick a tool, Terraform, Packer, or Ansible, and turn one manual task into code in your home lab. And I guarantee you, once you do that with that project-based learning that I'm a huge advocate for, you're going to be hooked. If you like this video, hit like, subscribe, and ring the bell for more home lab automation ideas. If you have questions, drop them in the comments below and check out the blog post linked in the description for code samples and deeper dives. Thanks for watching. Stay safe out there. Keep on home labbing and I will see you in the next video.